Hi, everyone. I am Sarah McDermott, the founder of Prindy, and I am here today with Leah Borromeo, who is the director behind the short documentary, The Mortician of Manila. So The Mortician of Manila is an official selection of the 2020 Prindy Film Fest, which this year will be taking place virtually from September 10th to the 13th. And this is a film that you do not want to miss. Um, so Leah, this film is so powerful and so layered with just different themes and issues. I'm just very excited to have you here today so that we can delve into it just a little bit more. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, for sure, Sarah. Thank you so much for, for having me on. And also thank you for including it, especially because, you know, I think the important thing about having a film like this is, is not just to, 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 you know, have it broadcast and have it out there and sort of like a lot bigger audiences, but actually I just wanted to have it in, in sort of audiences that are kind of informed that are smaller, that are able to discuss the issues, that are actually able to, to, to have a much more of an impactful uh, effect on the themes that we're talking about. Wonderful. Um, so to, to kind of give everyone just a very quick overview of the film, and I'll let you kind of go into it in a little bit more depth, um, this film deals sort of primarily with the war on drugs taking place in the Philippines and this current policy in place of, um, of eradicating, you know, drug use and the selling of drugs, not through jailing and arrests, um, but for, through an authorization for law enforcement to kill anyone really that is even suspected of, um, of dealing drugs. Um, and using drugs. So you can speak to that maybe just a little bit more, Leah, uh, give us a little more of an interview and just tell us about what sort of drew you to this subject matter um, originally. Well, I mean, this is one of those films where it's, it's almost a case of, of me spending most of my life kind of, you know, I, I, in terms of background, um, I grew up a Filipino American. Uh, we left the Philippines in the 80s because my mom had to flee the Marcos government. So he, he was the previous dictator. Mm -hmm. And that, that's going kind to of split our family in half. And so my whole life has been kind of colored by this. Um, almost, yeah, it's a, it's a psychosocial trauma that was kind of played out on the, on the international stage. So I've been spending most of my life kind of avoiding it and running away from it. And then one year, basically, my mom passed away we lost um one of our you know planned children and it was all it was just a year of loss after loss after loss and i was basically sitting in, in canada uh, at a lake uh, we used to have a house up there and i was just thinking what am i going to do you know now that you know, i'm not going to have this child and my, my mom is gone and everything else and i was reading a book by a journalist called jonathan miller called um, Duterte Harry. And through reading that, I just said, all right, I, I need to get back to kind of the issues that actually formed me and that, that, that kind of shaped me. So this was, you know, a big deep dive into um, a personal trauma as well as a collective trauma, because that's one thing I discovered through making this film is that a lot of Filipino diaspora people in that diaspora have a lot of personal trauma which is kind of on the canvas of an international trauma of a much bigger political one so this is what uh, that kind of drew me to, to to making a film about that in a way that that you know because a lot of films about the drug war have always been hyper sensationalized they they tend to be about the assassins they tend to be about the people who do all the shooting they tend to be about all the people who you know they just they they want the bodies mm -hmm. um in this case obviously you get the bodies but i wanted something a little bit more meditative and contemplative and somebody who was actually there at the cold face of of the issues but also not necessarily so combative not necessarily doing all of the you know, gun ho, um, gun ho shooting stuff. I wanted somebody who was actually just, you know, the guy who processed, the admin, the the, the mortician. Mm -hmm. Nobody had really done a film about the, the the administrative end of this drug war, and that was what basically drew me to to trying to find a character like Orly. And fortunately, I knew a couple of photojournalists, and one of them just a guy called Ezra Kayan said, I think I might have the guy for you. I was like, oh yeah. So he sent me a couple of shots of him and I said, well, he's perfect. He had this hat, he had the funeral home. 
the sign at the top said open 24 hours and i'm just like okay isn't it <laughs> like i gotta meet this person and you know i was already going out to manila for christmas so decided to meet up with him there mm -hmm. and that's when he kind of agreed to uh, to be part of the film um, and fortunately al jazeera also agreed to to back me up into making it it was it was a case it wasn't very difficult at all actually it was a, one of the easiest cells that i've ever had to do um back of a napkin i've got an idea what do you think of this and somebody's like yes pretty much you know, straight away so it's great to have that kind of support i think as a filmmaker as well from a place that you don't have to I suppose work so hard to get to, to get the job done you know it was just a simple phone call with an idea and you know it's, how realistic is this pretty you know and then they said yeah okay. so they trust me i trust them and we ran with it. i think by yeah i came up with the idea in september and by february i was filming it so. Yeah. I, I do love that you took the approach of kind of looking through the mortician's eyes a little bit and just giving that that different point of view because like you said I, it's I haven't seen it in anything else and it, it was just a very unique way to sort of process what was going on and it just it added so much to just in terms of <laughs> seeing it through the point of view of different people um, and, and like you I think you wrote in your director statement just different classes you know um, and that kind of brought to the table, which which was really really interesting. So you mentioned that you had kind of been heading back to Manila for Christmas for Christmas anyway. So one of my questions was going to be whether or not this had been your first time back since since childhood. But I'm I'm guessing that you had been back in the Philippines. Um, yeah, I I had been back, but I, I I didn't really make it a kind of uh, habit to go back too often. Mm -hmm. um, but this was definitely my first time back since Duterte was in power. Right. Um, so he came in, in in 2016, and before that, I, I think I, I'd done another film in the Philippines on mining um, and and its effects on on, on women um, and and women's workers communities. Um, in the sense that basically it's, they they'd been eradicated um, to the point where they'd been shifted off to essentially doing laundry or prostitution. Um, after being quite self-sufficient, um, the job options slim. So, but that was back in 2015. So I, you know, there was a different government in charge, a whole different, whole different ball game. So going back to what you knew was a dictatorship and to what you know now is actually a, a hyper-militarized dictatorship where they now have laws that you know could basically deem me a terrorist mm -hmm. um, because there is a terror bill which effectively equates any dissent uh, with terrorism mm -hmm. you know it's kind of the philippines is making it egypt again it's it's, it's following a kind of um, quite a dictatorial uh, stance mm -hmm. so yeah it's it was it was it was a trip going back then because mm -hmm. it was you know I, I had genuine concerns uh, about safety not so much for myself but for everyone i was working with and everyone who i was talking to and who was going to be participating because i can helicopter in and out i have that privilege i have you know a number of nationalities and i live in different countries and all that sort of thing so i have a lot of privilege behind me but the likes of Orly, the likes of Angelita, the likes of everyone else, they cannot, you know, mm -hmm. that cannot happen. So for them. Wow. Now, now in working with them, I'm, I'm always so curious when it comes to, to documentary filmmakers, um, engaging with Orly, and you also just mentioned Angelita, who's the, who's the mother of, um, of someone who is killed in this war on drugs um, campaign, and, and just you have some really just, gut-wrenching scenes with her of just real raw grief. And I'm always just very curious um, when you're shooting those scenes and when you're, you're working with them, how you, know, how you get them to kind of let you into these very personal moments and, and draw them out and share that, which I imagine must be very, very difficult. It's not that difficult for me and it's much harder for them. Yeah, um, but I expect that 
what Angelita will say is that, you know, it's, it's just something that she just has to roll with. I mean, as, as she's told me a number of times, it's, you know, she's already lost one of the most precious things in her life, which is her child. Um, you know, she's got very little else left to lose. Right. So that's why she agreed to be in the film. And I keep, you know, I kept asking her through her filming, I was like, you know, do you, are you still comfortable with this? Are you okay with this? She was like, yeah, it's fine. I mean, there were, you know, for every Angelita, there was so many, there was five or six others who wouldn't do it at all because, you know, they are genuinely scared. Mm. Like genuinely frightened for their lives. We were chased out of funeral homes. We were chased out of, you know, a number of houses, various neighborhoods where it was slightly sketchy to be in. Uh, where they have these kind of, you know, small corridors and roads where there's only really one way in and out. Mm. Um, you know, places where people get killed, uh, places where you'd still see fresh blood on the walls from, or, or browned blood from where somebody had been uh, felled. I expect. Mm. And so, you know, it's been, there are people there who are very like, genuinely frightened. Mm -hmm. So Angelita has, is, a, is a unique person with a unique kind of, of courage. Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you mentioned, I think you just touched, you touched in there a little bit about just this genuine fear and, and sometimes being chased out of funeral homes. And I, I do remember in the film, there was some mention, it was another funeral home, not Orly's, but um, being sort of an accomplice to, to what's going on. So I don't know if you want to speak to that at all. Um, some yeah. of the situations, yeah. I mean, there there's a lot of criminality there, and one of the things that you can get about Orly is like, you know, when you when I ask, you know, it's whether he's an angel or a devil, mm -hmm. uh, and a few other things like that. It's one of the things that that makes that fascinates me so much about him, and then that that makes him, I suppose, these days what something I would I would now call friend, mm -hmm. is that he is, you know, for all of his pro Marcos and and pro Duterte political leanings. Um, that is a product of where he has come from. That is a product of what he is and who he is. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that I am somebody who is anti that or comes from a different op to an opposition to that uh, is because I'm a product of, of where I'm from. And that's all class-based. A lot of this is very much class-based. Um, so with Orly, I mean, the, the, the fascinating thing about him is that he is totally straight. You know, for what he does and who he deals with, he could be so much more corrupt, making so much more money, um, raking it all in, and not really giving too much of a damn about the people who he is burying. Um, but he does. You know, he will work there with the church to try to get them discounts. He will try to give them as much of a break as possible. You know, I mean, he's, he's by far not the most up and up of individuals and in some of his, you know, attitudes and, and a couple of the things that he's actually sort of said would, you know, make your most perverted uncle blush. But he would still, you know, he is somebody who does believe in playing it straight to a certain degree. Um, and there are people out there who are a lot more unscrupulous than he is. Um, and that's one of the things that, that I'm, I'm actually quite, you know, was, was painfully reminded of um, was that there are people there who are a little bit more literally cutthroat mm. than Orly. Right. Uh, and Orly is actually quite, you know, that's one of the reasons why he has so many journalists and so many people coming up to him and so many friends is that, you know, he really doesn't have that much to hide. Mm -hmm. You know, where he, he's opened his workplace or home to everyone to come in and out. And you can just walk in and out and turn up to Orly's place. Mm -hmm. And you'll be welcomed, which is kind of weird. But it's, you know. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I was, I was very struck watching the film and you reminded me of it when, when you were talking about this, you know, how he does try to help people get discounts and to manage this, whereas other places really are not. They're just gouging. And I was very struck by how 
this policy and the war on drugs, you know, in adversely, in a, <laughs> in a very unbalanced way is affecting the poor and then how it, it's happening again when they have to just be buried that the poor are, are you know, um, faced with these gin ginormous fees just to simply be buried and it's, it's just so unbalanced. Um, so I didn't know if you could speak for a, a minute just about how this is affecting the poor and, and the imbalance between the classes, like you mentioned. I mean, we also have to kind of speak to, to things like the coronavirus, right? So when you're dealing with people who are, let's say you're middle class and, and, and you have, in this sort of day and age, you found yourself you know, dead um, of possible corona complications, you know, your family will still be able to kind of hold some form of memoriam for you, although, you know, your, your, your body is pretty much quickly dispatched or whatever it is. You know, if you have the money, you can still show some form of respect or whatever it is that you want us to do. Whereas recently, you know, what you've had to do was if you die in a slum, somebody comes in, maybe they'll pick up your body the same day, maybe they'll pick it up the next day, maybe they might leave it for two days, but they will or these guys will basically turn up, pick up your body, shove it into a stretcher, um, and quickly cremate it and send it off to a funeral place and rule the cremated. And then you have to go and pick your relative up. Mm. No tests, no nothing. They will, they've treated every, a lot of the bodies just as corona cases. Mm. So, you know, that's what happens when you're poor. Mm. When you have a little bit of cash, you know, you're allowed to at least, have some kind of memorial. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the, dis like, the disparaging things that happens. I mean, the other thing is, you know, you see the wake and the reason why they have that wake, I mean, ga like public gambling is, is actually technically I mean, you, you, the, what they were doing there, playing all those card games. You're not supposed to be doing that, but they do it in order to raise money because that's all you, they can do to raise money for the funeral. You know, so they have to do this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, what, what, um, yeah. <laughs> so what for you are um are some of the most haunting moments of this of this film or the key things that you want people just to remember and, and walk away with? Wow. Mm -hmm. Um Will this be on before or after the film? Before, so in the lead up. So, it's, yeah, you might want to be ah, not no to, spoilers. Not to give things away, there's, but <laughs> yeah, there's there's a there's a couple of scenes there, mm -hmm. which I think you will probably remember, um, mm -hmm. and none of any of the poverty that you see uh, was staged in that way, mm -hmm. you know. There, there were, what you see is what you get, I think, with, with this film. So the cramped spaces, the fact that people are living one on top of each other. Um, there is no sense of privacy at all. Uh, you know, this is not your Philippine holiday video. Um, it's, you know, there were things in this film we had to leave out um but it still makes the film the film is still bleak mm -hmm. because of you know uh we we will still you know this is the kind of this is the lightest we could get i think uh mm -hmm. with this film yeah. and and that's it's kind of you know I, I i will still look back on the edits and, and I, I still talk to the editor occasionally i think you know like first two days or so of looking back at the rushes we're just going like oh what's the body count and then we just we were totting up the body count and we were also mindful of the fact that it wasn't at the peak of the killings right. where you were seeing in orley's place alone you know 20 or 30 a day wow um whereas we're getting like 20 or 30 a week so we're we're dealing with the slow traffic wow 
So, you know, in, at, at its peak, there were people stacked up one on top of the other on, um, in metal shelving. Right. Um, and then put three, sometimes four, to a small grave, which is, you know, they call them apartment graves because they look like, you know, you'll see them, but they look like tiny little holes of, of concrete. And you essentially just shoved as many people in there as you could. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not your permanent resting place. You know, if you can't afford to keep your relative there, I mean, your your fees or whatever it is you pay for, keep your keep that relative's body in that hole um, for the first couple of years, depending on the contract you sign. If you don't maintain the upkeep, they will take the body out and put it, you know, take the bones, put it in a bag. Mm -hmm. You know, you can pulverize it and give it to you or, or make the rest of it and give it to you. Um, or they'll just um, put them in a mass grave wow. if they don't. You know, there was a couple of mass grave burials that, that Orly was involved in and that involved a lot, a lot of people who he couldn't identify in the morgue and they needed to clear out some space. And so he had to wait until he picked up, you know, enough bodies in the cold store. And then one day just went down to one of the many random holes in the wall mm. and put them in there. Mm. And they will be there for oh, about a year, a couple of years. Mm. Somebody comes in, their job is to take to clear out those graves. Mm. You know, it's a grim, grim, grim life, um, and you know, we didn't show half of it. I think right. it's probably what you should remember when you're <laughs> watching the film. It's, it, it, it is worse. Yes, you're selective. Uh, yeah, with what you're showing. Yeah, it does actually get worse. Wow. So. Now I know um, so we only have like a minute or two or two left. I know you most of your filmmaking work or all your filmmaking work deals with sort of these these sort of social issues. Um, what is the project that you're currently working on, and what's coming up for you next? Ah, well, this is you know slightly less trauma and well, I wouldn't say less trauma inducing. It's just like slightly less slightly less visually trauma inducing, uh, <laughs> where we're taking it's called Twelve Thousand Years in Fragments. Mm -hmm. uh, which is part of a, a, a festival called Electric Dreams. But we, it's part of a greater project called Climate Symphony, mm -hmm. where we've basically taken 12,000 years of climate change data uh, and translated that data into a four-part symphony mm -hmm. that tells the story of human intervention on this planet across the past 12,000 years. Mm -hmm. So we discuss global warming, we discuss climate change, we discuss our effect as humans, mm -hmm. uh, on everything that, that, that we have to the present day. Uh, we use a lot of archive.org, free and open source archive uh, material in order to make the film, which is live BJ'd um, as the orchestra will play. Well, these days it's an electronic orchestra. It's intended to be a live one, but you know, Corona, uh, <laughs> so our electronic orchestra, um, which consists of various musicians who've contributed and recorded things and then we kind of mix it. Um, so that will be played out live along with the film and people are uh, encouraged to go onto archive.org and if you tag your thing, electric dreams is one word. If you upload uh, 30 seconds maybe or 90 seconds of some video material, we will put that material in the film. Um, that following, you know, that following performance, or even that evening, depending on how quickly we can process everything. So, you know, we're, we're trying to get people's actual stories of themselves and of their lives onto um, onto that sort of live montage that we're doing uh, for this project. So that's how that's how we kind of developed it. Uh, because of the coronavirus, I guess. It was a much more static symphony, a straight up symphony mm -hmm. before that. But now we've had to think a little bit smarter about how we engage people. Great. Creative. That sounds amazing. <laughs> uh, thanks. Yes.
best of luck moving forward on it, Leah. And, and thank you so much again for being here today. So just to kind of uh, remind everyone, this was Leah Borromeo, the director of The Mortician of Manila, which is absolutely a must see short documentary. So be sure to pick to check that out um, in this year's Prindy virtual film fest this year, everything's adapting <laughs> with coronavirus. Right. Yes, <laughs> everyone's figuring it out. Um, but thank you so much again, Leah. It's been such a pleasure having you. No, thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you everybody who has taken the time out to actually engage with this subject. And if you want to find me, I'm at M-O-N-S-T-R-I-S on Twitter. Um, and send me a couple of questions. I'll, I'll answer them as you know as, as much as possible. And if anyone wants to an, answer, ask me any questions, they can ask me on Twitter. And I'll be sure to get back to them. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Leah. Yeah. Again. Wonderful. Have a great day. <laughs> okay. And don't, don't drink bleach. <laughs> yes. Don't drink, don't inject yourself with it. Yeah. Don't inject bleach. Don't, don't. <laughs> no, don't do it. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much.